Listening test one. This is a practice listening test which resembles the international English language testing system listening test. The test consists: answer the questions as you listen to the recording. Note that the recording is played once only. Please turn to section one. Section one. George and Lisa are overseas students studying in Britain. They are returning home for the summer holidays. First, look at questions one to four. You will see that there is an example already done for you. For this question only, the conversation relating to the example will be played first. That'll be twenty-three pounds. Right, there's your change. Have a nice trip. Oh, I'll just get your bags out of the boot. Thank you very much. The taxi driver said that he would get the bags out of the boot of his taxi. So the correct answer is A. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Now listen carefully and answer questions one to four. That'll be twenty-three pounds. Right, there's your change. Have a nice trip. Oh, I'll just get your bags out of the boot. Thank you very much. Now, George, let's find the check-in desk. Yes, but with all the changes they have made here at the airport, I'm not sure where the check-in desk is. I know it's strange, isn't it? Why don't we ask for help? Good idea. What about that man sitting down over there? Which one? The one with the hat on? But what about the man with the blue uniform and the cap sitting on the trolley? He's bound to know. He looks like he works here. Okay, I'll ask him. Excuse me. Could you tell me where the check-in desk for France Air is, please? Ah,、uh, let me think. I haven't worked here very long. The best way to get there would be to turn left at the end here, where the cafe is, and then go straight ahead until you're opposite the departure gate's entrance. No, no, sorry. Um, it might be quicker to turn right as soon as you get past the cafe, and keep going along the corridor until you come to the sliding doors at the end, on the left. Yep, that's it. All the check-in counters are in a hall there. I'm pretty sure France Air is directly to your left as you walk in the hall. Thanks a lot. So it's left past the cafe and then right opposite the bookshop. You can't miss it. Come on then, Lisa. We don't want to be late, and I want some time to get a cup of coffee and look around the bookshop. Okay, George. But I want to go and wash my hands first. I'll meet you at the check-in desk. George now speaks to the clerk at the check-in counter. Listen to the conversation and fill in the information on the excess baggage form in the spaces numbered five to ten. First, you have some time to look at the form. Now listen to the conversation. And answer questions five to ten. Good morning. Can I help you? Yes, I would like to check in for flight FA four nine two. Very good. Can I have your ticket and passport, please? Yes, here you are. Okay, thanks.、Uh, if you could just put your suitcase on the scales. Oh, I also have this extra box that I want to take as well. Okay. Well, that's extra luggage, so I'll have to get to fill out an excess baggage declaration certificate. It'll cost extra, I'm afraid. Let's see, forty、uh, pounds exactly. Ah well, what's the form for? It's just a form you have to fill out. So if there are any problems, we'll know where you are and how to contact you. So if you can give me a few details, I'll key in the information. Okay then. Now your passport says your name is Lavillier. Is that right? Yes, George Lavillier. George、uh, L A V I double L I E R S. Good. 
No, nationality, French. No, wait a minute, it's a Swiss passport. Well, yes, I live in France, but I was born in Switzerland. Swiss, very good. Flight number FA492. Destination is? Paris. Are you connecting with any other flight in Paris, or will you be staying there? No, I'm spending my holiday in Paris. Well, Sèvres, just outside Paris. Okay, so what's the phone number there? Uh, let me think. The country code for France is double uh, three, and the number is one nine eight six one four five three seven. Right. So that's double three one nine eight six one four five three seven. Yes, that's it. And can you tell me briefly what you have in the box? Well, there are some books. Just university textbooks from last term, some clothes, and, oh yeah, my computer disks. Okay, thank you. And what would be the approximate value of the contents? Oh, quite a bit, actually. About, yes, about 150 pounds. That's all? There's your receipt for the box, your passport and ticket, and here's your boarding pass. Gate 7. You can board the plane in about 35 minutes. Have a nice flight. That is the end of section 1. You now have 30 seconds to check your answers to section 1. Now turn to section 2. Section 2. You will now hear a short news item. First, you have some time to look at the questions. Now listen to the news item and answer questions 11 to 20. Good morning. We have just received word of a major earthquake off the coast of Mandaland in the Pacific Ocean. At present, scientists are unsure if the quake, registering 6.5 on the Richter scale, will cause a tsunami, a giant wave of water because it is not known yet at precisely what depth the earthquake took place. The geographical location of the earthquake is in a mountainous undersea region of the Pacific Ocean, which has not been fully and accurately explored. Scientists are also concerned that the quake might set off a chain reaction of events in the Earth's crust. Meanwhile, on all the islands within a radius of 1,000 kilometres of the earthquake, and on the mainland of Mandaland, authorities are urging everyone to leave their homes and make their way up the mountains where they will be safe if a tsunami occurs. On islands where there are no high levels of land, army helicopters from Australian bases in Mandaland are airlifting villages to safety. The last major earthquake in this region caused a tsunami which devastated large areas of Mandaland and killed over 2,000 people. The economy of the country was seriously damaged and it took more than 20 years for public buildings and people's homes to be completely rebuilt. It is hoped that this time, if another tsunami does occur, the warnings given will prevent large-scale destruction of life. Although it has proved impossible to build sea walls that can withstand such giant waves of water, and attempts to do so on Mandaland were soon abandoned. However, the reconstruction of all large buildings near the coast, including hotels and resorts, was undertaken with the threat of a tsunami in mind. The availability of fast and easy exit from all lower floors to the rooftop was made a requirement for every building over two storeys high,
by law. If you have relatives or persons you wish to contact on Mandaland, it is suggested you do not phone direct. All lines are currently jammed, but contact the authorities on the hotline shown on your screen. That number is 0179 Stay tuned for further developments as they come to hand. This is Trent Dunwell for the Channel 4 News Team. The time is now 4.30. After the break, Sports News with Jim McKenna. That is the end of Section 2. You now have 30 seconds to check your answers to Section 2. Now turn to Section 3. Section 3. Next, you will hear an interview on the radio. First, you have some time to look at the questions. Now listen to the interview and answer questions 21 to 25. Good afternoon and welcome to Working Lives. My name is Sue Holt. This week we continue our series by looking at a job that is often thought of as adventurous, exotic and highly desirable. We're going to take a behind the scenes look at the airline hospitality industry. What is the reality behind the smart uniform and ever-ready smile of the flight attendant? We're lucky enough to have in the studio Julie Nevard, who works for British Air World and is a senior member of the cabin crew staff. Thank you for finding the time to speak to us. I know that you must have a busy schedule. My pleasure. Yes, it is a very full-time job. But I think you realise that very early on in your career. How long have you been involved in in-flight hospitality? Well, I trained for a year at the British Air World Training School and I'd already taken a diploma in hospitality and tourism after I left school. So, all in all, about five years. No, more like six years. So your training was at college? Well, yes, uh, the preliminary training. But then the British Air World Training course in Manchester was a more specialised hospitality course. I suppose you could call the diploma my major professional qualification. I see. Now tell me, is the job as glamorous as most people believe? Absolutely not. Of course there are many good things about the job. You know, you never know where you might be going. For example, I still get excited when I see the new roster for the first time. Knowing I'll soon be off somewhere I haven't been before, on a new route. The best thing, of course, is that all the time I'm meeting new people. But people don't realise that what I get to see most of is the inside of hotel rooms, and most hotel rooms are pretty similar. Also, it's like I'm working, but the majority of my passengers are on holiday. Sometimes it's hard to deal with all their demands. There are times you just want to shout, I'm doing my best, I've got a job to do, leave me alone. But that doesn't happen very often. Then tell me, what is your main responsibility during a flight? That's hard to say, really. Well, we're responsible for all the needs and demands of each and every passenger, for up to ten hours on some long-haul flights, not to mention the safety of the plane and all the passengers. I suppose if I have to come up with a single answer, it'd be passenger comfort. Do you find yourself going to the same place as often? There are four or five major destinations that we fly to more regularly than others. Yes, I've got to know some cities very well. Oh, really? Which destinations are those? Well, 
There's Paris, Frankfurt, Rome, Kennedy. Kennedy Airport in, in Los Angeles? New York. These are the most frequent destinations with British Air World. So how do you deal with the changing time zones? It's something you just have to get used to. Everybody in the industry has a special tip to beat jet lag on longer flights. But me? I just make sure that I'm regularly changing the time on my watch. I find that if I change the time little by little and fairly frequently, well, that seems to work well for me. You see, I have two watches, the one I'm constantly adjusting and the one with the original time at departure. That sounds like a good idea. In the next part of the radio interview, complete the table with no more than three words for each answer. First, you have some time to look at the table and questions. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. So, have you seen many changes in the type of services you offer? Oh, yes. These days the competition is much tougher. I suppose the result is that the consumer, the traveller, has a much better deal. Well, the seats are bigger, more comfortable than they were ten years ago. The in-flight entertainment, the films, now they're all recent release blockbusters. They weren't ten years ago. But the two biggest improvements have been to do with the smoking restrictions and the upgrading of the meals. Oh, right. Tell me about these two changes. Yes. The restriction on smoking has had a twofold benefit. Firstly, the atmosphere is much more pleasant. And secondly, the fire risk is greatly reduced. You know, we used to have people dropping cigarettes, burning the seats. A dreadful fire risk, can you imagine? Terrible. I, for one, never understood why anyone was ever allowed to smoke on aeroplanes in the first place. Um, and the meals? Ah, with so many carriers vying for passengers on the same route, you just have to offer more. Vegetarian meals, choice of two hot meals, interesting, exotic, gourmet food, all this is now commonplace in our economy class galleys. And for the business and first class passengers, the food is as good as in any world-class restaurant. Top chefs, great presentation, nutritious ingredients. Really, quite lovely. And finally, what advice or words of warning would you give to school leavers considering a career in this industry? Well, that's a difficult question. I'd say think long and hard about why you want to do it. It's not all glamorous, and it can be very hard work. Julie? It's been fascinating talking to you. Thank you for your time. And just before we go, next week we will be talking to... That is the end of Section 3. You now have 30 seconds to check your answers to Section 3. Now turn to Section 4. Section 4. You will hear part of an introductory seminar given at a hotel management school. First you have some time to look at the questions. Now listen to the lecture and answer questions 31 to 40. Welcome to the first seminar of the International Hotel Hospitality and Management course. My name's Garth Walters and I'm one of the career advisors at the school and uh, this afternoon I intend to give you an overview of the four core subject options available to you in this course. 
one of which you will need to choose as your core or main subject by the end of the first week. Each core subject prepares students for work in one of four major career areas front desk and reception work, drink and bar service, restaurant service, and lastly, guest relations. For each area that I have mentioned, we will explore the personal skills required, the professional qualifications needed, and the career opportunities available. To start with, we are going to take a look at front desk and reception work. In some ways, the reception desk is both the uh, face and the nerve center of a hotel. It's the first point of physical contact with the client, and a close and professional relationship should be immediately struck up. The psychology behind the need for creating a good first impression and maintaining it is fairly obvious. But how to do this effectively constitutes a major slice of the work that all students will be doing in the first few weeks of this course, regardless of the option that you choose. Now, the type of person who is best suited for front desk and reception work is self-confident, caring and sensitive, intelligent, and also able to work calmly in the glare of the public eye, when it's as busy as it often gets, without appearing to panic. The ability to speak more than one language is, naturally, a great asset in this job, as is clear diction and familiarity with switchboard operating systems, a technical skill that is taught only in the front desk and reception core option. Qualifications? Well, ideally, an associate diploma with at least one foreign language would be good, but this is not strictly necessary. You are encouraged, however, to take up another language. As for the career opportunities available, um, after a few years, competent front desk staff can begin working in reception management, that is, being responsible for the VIP guests and coordinating and arranging conferences and meetings at the hotel. We now move on to the second core subject option, drink and bar service. Usually, you need to have completed a recognized bar course to begin serving drinks in a top hotel, but you'll all be taught the basics, since a percentage of the work in each option is compulsory for all students. Obviously, an outgoing and lively personality are prerequisites for this type of work. Also, an ability to work late into the night. So, if you are a morning person, this type of work is definitely not for you. There is much more to skilled bar work than just serving drinks. It involves an intimate knowledge of most alcoholic beverages, mixers, wines and beers, as well as mixing techniques and the correct choice of drinks to accompany meals. An effective member of a drink and bar service team can eventually move into more specialized areas. Two of the main avenues open are cellar management, dealing exclusively with wine and fortified wines, the uh, selection, purchase, storage and general upkeep of the hotel cellar, and the other area is working in coordination with fine restaurants as a wine manager or consultant, with the emphasis placed more on the bonding of wine with food. Naturally, for both careers, a wide and thorough knowledge and appreciation of wine varieties and styles is essential. The third core subject option is restaurant service. Well, a love of food and its presentation is a must for anyone considering this line of work. Also, life in a restaurant can be hectic, hot and very busy. The hours are long and the competition for certain positions within the industry is tough. But by completing the International Hotel Hospitality and Management Catering Core option, you will be able to enter restaurant service as an assistant or grade three chef. As a grade three chef, you will be responsible for the preparation of salads and desserts, stocking and cleaning the fridges, etc. And as you learn, you can progress to grade two. And then with time, grade one or chief chef. As you become more familiar with different styles of food and presentation, you may wish to specialize in a particular area, but as I said, the competition, especially in the larger, more reputable hotels, 
can be fierce. Right. Um, before I move on to the last option, guest relations, I want to say a few words about how you can best choose your core subject. But, uh, are there any questions before I continue? That is the end of section 4. You now have 30 seconds to check your answers to section 4.